gyroscope and magnetometer. So, um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of the sensors and they are embedded already in some of the smartwatches and wearables and even mobile phones. You can even download an application <laughs> in your mobile phone and that will allow you to record the data of the position, uh, acceleration um, and gyroscope from your mobile phone. So in case you don't have one of these ones or you at some point want to track the activity of people so you can uh, even do those um, type of interventions. So it's pretty ubiquitous and uh, what I'm saying is a lot of companies now like um, playing more with the combination of all the data to uh, perform what is called motion capture. This is a technique in which we record the movement using um, many different techniques. Uh, vis uh, uh, computer vision was the one that has been mostly used and is the, the, the ground truth, but a accelerometer is kind of like gaining a lot of terrain in the market just because it's very cheap and uh, certainly unobtrusive. So that's probably one of the most interesting aspects of the inertial motor units. So what can we get? So what is the type of data? I, you remember we yesterday we were talking about uh, ECG. So we, what can you extract from ECG? Same thing with EDA. So it's giving you an information, but what are the things that you can get? So from a kinematic point of view, you remember there's a difference between kinematic and kinetic. So here we are not recording forces. So we are totally neglected and blinded with all forces, but we are extracting the movement, so kinematic. Um, I've seen a, um, a good uh, categorization of the different um, type of kinematic data that you can extract using um, uh, these sensors. And they are categorized by, uh, by this uh, three categories, linear, angular, and nonlinear uh, motion. In the linear motion, all we have is basically trajectories. So you connect the IMUs one to three on different parts of the body, especially you try to follow certain uh, uh, patterns for connecting the IMUs in anatomical positions, and then you uh, basically can track the, the trajectories, X, Y, Z, velocities, and also accelerations. So that's called linear motion. More interestingly, and uh, a little bit of, you know, so, uh, there's, there's more complexity involved, you can also record angular motion. So in, uh, in uh, physiotherapy and a, a lot of the bi uh, biomechanic uh, analysis, what you really want to do is actually improve somehow what is called the range of movement. So the range of movement is defined by you know, every, every of the joints that we have, they have a specific range in which they can uh, move. So a minimum and a maximum um, uh, uh, in, in terms of the degrees. So what a lot of people, especially in rehabilitation engineering, want to see is basically based on a specific intervention, how people are progressing uh, in, re in regards to their range of motion. So each of the joints that we have, they have a specific arc of movement. So for instance, with the shoulder, like you cannot go over a certain amount of, of angles because that would be prejudicial for the participant. So, Using this, using a specific mathematical transformation, you can get the angles and the angular velocity, which is again something um, that is very insightful from a, a rehabilitation or assisted therapy point of view. I've seen a little bit of more uh, of this non-linear motion getting traction lately, so there's more and more research in which uh, you know what you are basically doing is using non-linear descriptors. So you move uh, to something that is called a phase um, space. So you, we're not talking about time any, any, uh, uh, in any of the variables, but you are basically parameterizing the time. So all, we, we're always talking about time series. But when we talk about nonlinear, in most of the cases, you are, for instance, comparing one angle versus the other angle. In this case, imagine you have two different inertial motor units, and instead of studying an individual joint, so what you want to see is how these joints behave once you um, are doing a specific movement with the other joint. So that's you know something that is more related to how the human body is connected itself. Like it's not an isolated unit. Like every every time you do a movement in one specific part of the body, there's another thing happening in, in the in the other part. So you want to see the dynamics of the whole system. So a lot of the nonlinear descriptors 
are basically based on multiple uh, inertial motor units and how do you combine them and the holy grail here is coordination so how um, coordinated the movement is based on non-linear descriptions uh, descriptors using uh, inertial motor units um, these are some of the um, kinematic features um, I think Sal was the one doing the this table with a lot of different papers. We tried to stay focused on not the, 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 the clinical applications of IMUs because that's, you know, that's a huge universe and there's plenty of biomechanic feature, uh, uh, features that you can use to extract. But we were trying to get more focused on the ones that people like us uh, working in human rubber interaction have been using or human human interaction have been using. What we notice is <clears throat> A lot of what they are trying to uh, do here is, for instance, characterize movements. So when you are interacting with a the system, they uh, hook you a, a, an IMU uh, on a wrist, and then you are interacting with a mouse, or with a new interface, and they're trying to characterize that, that movement once compared to uh, movements to another interface or another experimental condition. Um, they also, in some of the studies, looking for coordination. So there's some of the variables here that are related to those things. For instance, the kurtosis or the skew is it talk it, it tells you a little bit of the asymmetry of the distribution. So you know how spread the data was on an entire um, um, experiment. So a lot of these metrics are now being used also to train machine learning models, which is something that is you know happening also uh, with all the other signals that we were discussing uh, yesterday. Uh, however, one of the problems with all of this is again what we mentioned yesterday, intra-subject variability and how people can move differently and how you can create a, 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 a classifier to classify um, uh, specific movements or uh, patterns or psychological states or even emotions based on only movements. So what we will do right now is I'm going to show you how to collect data from IMU, uh, IMUs. Um, Christina will help me. She has been dealing a lot with the sensors. So uh, and then I'm going to switch to you know show you more or less how the sensors work, the type of uh, signal capturing that we do, and then uh, we will move to feature extraction. And then Sal will show us how to extract all of these features using uh, Python. So we can try to do one or two. So let me switch to this one. Yep. You can do a wrist if you want. Let's do uh, shoulder, maybe? Yep. Yeah. So in this case, you need to be very careful with the amount of uh, I use that you use and the posture that you're gonna use. For example, in this case, we're gonna do shoulder, but if you're gonna measure on, on a person, on a patient or a subject, you need to make sure that the person is not compensated with the trunk, for example. So maybe you can do it against a wall just to make sure that your back is straight, so you're only focusing on the shoulder. So for this one. Uh, once down. you click it, or you can put it also in your chair. Which one is the one? This the... The 76. C76. Mm. No. no. Well, uh, you have the USB dock. Normally you made a configuration of the sensor first. So the ones that we have configured, these ones, it's basically an update of the firmware and sampling frequency and all the important parameters. So it's good that you, I mean, it will save you some time if we just use the one okay. that has been already set up before, so we don't have to do that setup. There's a lot, plenty of research on activity tracking using IMUs. You just give the sensor to the people, uh, the sensor they have a button, they can record data with the SD, the button is a little bit tricky, uh, doesn't give you feedback that it's recording or not, 
Um, so anyway, so the main point is you can give this to a participant, be in the home to track more or less the movement, and then come back and make an analysis of you know an entire day of, of work. So you can ask people to lock the moment that they were doing a specific thing that you were uh, studying, and then you can uh, segment those and you know make that uh, individual analysis. You can also track the patient if you see that it's like moving or the person that you're working with. Because this like uh, is very sensitive, so like small changes can change the the angles, right? So you have to make sure that you put like that you're being very precise on this, on the postures that you use. There's also calibrations um, when you use, for example, one in the wrist and you know that the person is gonna compensate, you can put another one in the chest. And there are like some calibration movements that you can perform before, just to, to make sure that you uh, define the three X's when you're doing the analysis afterwards. So, yeah. Here, you the same, four, seven. Mm -hmm. Just double check. Yeah, yep. what is that? Seven, four, seven. You know what um, uh, Trevor is doing? What he did yesterday, just mm -hmm. he deleted. You forgot it and then no, it's working, you see. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. And then this it gives you the the options that you want to, to use, that you want to measure. Uh, you can use a gyroscope and a, an accelerometer, as you said. Uh, but I don't use I don't personally use magnetometer. There's like some people there they use it, some people they don't. Uh, it's just you have to make that decision. When, when it comes to analyze the data afterwards. So you can see here that there's like two types. It's, one is the low noise and the other one is the wide range. I think they differ based on the filters that they have in yes, the appliance. Yes, the, the filters that have been embedded in the, in the system. Yeah, so you can select it or not. A lot of the manufacturers, what they're doing right now is instead of throwing the hassle of you as researchers uh, needing to process a lot of basic things, they embedded already into the hardware so like the polar last time we were talking instead of you going applying all the filters to strike the peaks it gives you already the rr intervals which is super nice and i love the guys that are doing that mm -hmm. instead of the others that are just providing the raw data which is a and the most of the time it is mm -hmm. so we will go with the low noise isn't it yeah low noise gyroscope and then we will also check the gyroscope I think the same graph. So what are we seeing? <laughs> That's one of the good things of the sensor that lays pretty I mean for real time application, not having a like a huge delay is is that okay. So what are we seeing? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, no. You have been working on this. You can also like uh, change to graph. So because in that one you can see the angular uh, velocity and acceleration. So you can select two different graphs uh, to put like the different uh, variables. So it's not that messy as you see the, over there. Um, you can see now that I'm just changing, right? The direction of the accelerometer, and you can see the changes in the graph. So, the green and the brown one, right? So, what is the green and the brown? You know, we have over here, the, and you see the, the colors. Yeah. yeah. The gyro, the gyro is the. the Angular velocity. The, the purple, yeah. yeah. The gyros are the purple and the, the others, like the small ones that you see are there in the, more like in the, are the, the accelerometer. So it would be the, or the red, the blue, and the gray the would be the better. accelerometers. So it's easier for them to see it, right? Yeah. So we can, again, add more plots to it, so you can better visualize that. Um, important things when you're working with IMUs. First, like, is such an, uh, you know, unobtrusive, uh, sensor certainly, but um, um, uh, when you start adding more and more units, 
because you want to record more data so it can become a little bit obtrusive so if you put four instead of one because you want to get the shoulder the, the the elbow and the wrist then person will feel the all the straps and everything a little bit uncomfortable so be sure that uh, what it, whenever you are strapping is really because you have a clear hypothesis of you know the the that unit is needed again it's not about wiring a lot without you know just because we have all the sensors but it's like trying to wire every time you can uh, tie the sensors or the signal that you're recording to a research uh, question or to a specific hypothesis that you have yeah. So here, yeah, here you can see it's a little bit um, clearer. So this is uh, acceleration. So you can see that actually reacts, of course, to the position. But remember, it's acceleration. So whenever you want to get the um, uh, the position of the velocity, you need to uh, make the the, deriv the derivative of, of that function. And the um, the angular movement here, as I mentioned before, is not like degrees. So we wish it would be degrees, but it mostly has like some other units that you need to make a specific mathematical transformation to get uh, uh, the angle that you most of the time made. Um, cool thing about shimmer, that's probably one of the best things that I've seen uh, from shimmer device is you can actually attach, um, so all of the units they have um, INUs. So you can, with one, you can uh, collect EDA, PPG, which is something that we mentioned yesterday, that we also have a polar device, optical, to record uh, blood pressure, and EDA. So you can, you can, uh, you can with two units, actually record those three. So EDA, PPG? EDA and PPG and IMUs. IMUs. Mm -hmm. So they have like, these IMUs, you normally connect the PPG, and they are all coming with IMUs. Um, embedded so with one unit you more or less can get everything synchronized so there's a cool thing of that the shimmer device um, devices that uh, it's hard to like you know um, see it specifically do you remember that yesterday we were talking about uh, psychophysiological correlations so movement you know from this signal what you can infer about a, the psychological state of Christina? Let's <laughs> see. Maybe anything. I mean, uh, uh, electrodermal activity is a little bit more related to arousal. Uh, heart rate variability can be more related to uh, resilience and the response of the stressors and stress itself. Right? IMUs are pure movement. So, in your recording, pure movement. So, unless you have a specific scenario, context yeah. and specific hypothesis maybe you will be able to say because of the movement that she was doing during the interaction so she was i don't know uh, you, you can say that the person was um, agitated and yeah. the person was a little bit uncomfortable you can talk about ergonomic variables related to it but it's hard for you to make an assumption uh, by only using IMEA data so it's, it's unobtrusive easy to get but it's hard to map when it comes to psychological uh, states. So how the movement change under certain behaviors or you're looking for a specific pattern? So in different scenarios that also happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like basically it's more um, tracking. It's not, it's not that helpful when it comes to yeah, matching to, with a... To inferring psychological yeah. states. And Christina, can you try this? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this one basically, that one is measurement my my shoulder, right? But every movement in the in the upper extremity is gonna get an impact in the shoulder. So this is like that, that is very why, why shoulder? Why not also wrist? If I move the wrist, I'm moving my shoulder. Yeah. yeah. If I'm on my elbow, I'm moving my shoulder as well. Yeah. So that's why you have to be super precise of the movement that you choose. Yeah. Because in this case. I'm using my, if I want to measure my, my shoulder, I'm using this as a rigid element. Yeah, yeah. Right? As a, as a rigid element. Point of reference element. is your shoulder, right? The what, sorry? Point of reference is your shoulder. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, those yes. are the small things that in, you, know, you need to know in biomechanics. So if you want to measure something related to the shoulder, so you don't necessarily need to attach the sensor to the shoulder. You can get a proxy through attaching something that is 
certainly more comfortable uh, to the wrist. So this is uh, you know, a, a quick preview. Again, you can connect multiple ones, multiple segments, and visualize all of them. But uh, you know, just I wanted to do a, a quick view on this. Cool. So that was something that we didn't manage to. So which one? Oh. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It had a lot of oxygen on X and Y actually. It had a lot of bias on X and Y. It had a lot of so all of them in order to you know give you uh, a position that can be interpretable in the physical world so it needs to have coordinates of where are you placing it so most of the times you can get like uh so it's not like you sit down and it's going to give you a zero if you're here what if you put it over here what if you put it over here so you need to make initial calibration so it knows what is the zero the zero 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 of your matching with the physical world so that's, that's you know they, they, have, they have some options for coloration. Yes, and also filter of the because that's raw dead, right? So after you filter, it's gonna, it's gonna look smoother. The signal it's something that I'm struggling with still, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it looks a, a little bit smoother when, once you filter it. But yeah, it does. But it was weird because it was not changing. It was when 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 you see this uh, uh, like changes like rapidly, that's stress. Yeah. Okay, that was the small content that was um, that we uh, didn't manage to cover last uh, session. Today we will try to cover again the part of feature extraction. This is probably the most dense part of it. So it's the I would say this is the one in where most of the people tend to commit mistakes because there's a whole world of features that you can extract, and there's a whole world of things that you need to do before extracting the features in order to get good features of all the signal that you have. So, um, this is what uh, we're going to try to cover. Um, I'm going to share the slide so you will be able to access this. It's a pretty nice, it's called the psycho, uh, psychophysi uh, psychophysiology, psychophysiology Primer. It's basically a companion or uh, you know, many different chapters covering different signals. Table, there's a pretty nice table for table 4.1 that covers, like you know, um, different psychological states and how they have been mapped into features, the specific features of the signals that have been scientifically proved to work in describing uh, those psychological states. So you can access to it. And I'm going to try to show you some MATLAB and Python examples. Uh, that you, if you can, you can also record some signals, play with the feature extraction and signal processing algorithms, and you can uh, read more some of the plots, and we can, you know, chat chat about it. So the pipeline, uh, similar to you know how it happens in, in many uh, other fields, you have the user, you have the data recording process, feature extraction, and what is called the post hoc analysis in which you're basically trying to extract uh, the information that you want to make your uh, research question more addressable. However, so what uh, we want to normally do after doing the post hoc analysis, after having all the features extracted, uh, extracted uh, you want to run some statistical tests and basically compare, as we mentioned yesterday, the control group of the baseline group, uh, the control group versus the experimental group. So you want to see how different they were based on the physiological features. The problem with this is there's a lot of people uh, that just want to go this way. So a lot of people that they just want to go there, wire people with signals, and basically jump directly to the paper.
because there's a, like a lot of things over here that sometimes we don't understand. The information is not that clear. Unfortunately, the community hasn't been able to bring uh, sometimes some standards or some tools. This is still um, something that is recently happening. There are more and more tools for us to do it, and uh, people are trying to make those tools more uniform. But still, is um, there is a there is a lack of uh, standardization. So soft process of feature instruction, they need to happen. So if you get only the features just by, uh, you know, um, applying some, uh, some algorithms that you find uh, here and there without doing things like pre-processing, without doing normalization, without doing a specific selection of the features, and then you just throw those features to a black box, machine learning, deep learning algorithm, probably what you're going to get is something that you cannot interpret. So something that is simply, is simply, oh, this is good for classifying A and B, but it's hard for you to say what is the type of physiological phenomenon that you're relating with that specific algorithm. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of, of, of my list of filters for pre-processing, the ones that I'm using the most and the most popular feature, uh, features uh, from each of the signals that we just um, have seen here. So um, consider those steps. Every time that you are doing an experiment with physiological signals, this is probably where you're going to spend most of the time. So checking, validating the features and seeing that they are actually describing uh, something that you want to see before going to the statistical test. And the statistical test can give you a significance. Um, very quickly or very easily, you can just compare two things and you know it's significantly different, but doesn't mean something uh, for the type of phenomenon that you are studying. M most of the cases they don't. I just something else to add so because I, I have this problem with with uh, people dilatation of coin glasses, and something that you can also check as for the processing is you go to the website of the technical, uh, for example, the toy glasses, and they tell you okay, the value should be go ranging from this one to this one more or less. And if you see artifacts that go outside that range, you should filter them. So there is something that you can see already in the website of, of the actual devices that they okay, check this data, this should be from this uh, this, uh, this this range, or these other things that can go wrong, or these other artifacts that can happen. So they, they also give you some, some advice on how to you know clean up this stuff. The Shimmer devices they have some uh, field documentation, it's not as good as we would like, but it's still it's good enough to give you ranges. To give you values in which you can compare the signal. Uh, so just to be sure that you're collecting what you want. An example. So you remember that we were talking yesterday ECG. So we are recording the ECG. Um, suddenly when you start moving, when you start doing exercise with the ECG, then you will start seeing that instead of getting an ECG like this, like you know, with a fix, you will start seeing that the ECG is actually moving. So that phenomenon is called baseline wandering and it happens a lot when you are doing exercise during ECG and you will see the signal like this. So it's not like a super cool signal with the RP very well um, established, but you will see like the baseline is moving. So if you go and apply your RP detection algorithms directly to this one, you will get a lot of troubles in trying to tune the peak detection algorithm because it's complex, like you see, it's oscillating and it doesn't have a, a clear baseline. So what you do is basically apply a low, um, low frequency filter, basically you extract the oscillation in low frequency, then you explore the high frequency filter, so you uh, get a, a high pass, so you can uh, see also what are the high oscillations based on the, on, the, on the peaks, and then after that you will be able to do a correction of the baseline one. So it's basically extracting the, the heights, the, the low frequencies, and bringing the peaks into a line. Then you can apply the RP algorithm here, and you wouldn't have, you know, the basic RP detection algorithm that uh, comes with MATLAB will be able to get you the peaks instantaneously, so you don't have to uh, do a lot of things. So this is what I'm, um, I'm telling you that before doing any feature extraction, you really need to explore your signal and clear your signal and remove the artifacts and understand your signal. If you go from here to here, the peaks that you're gonna get 
um, they probably are gonna come with a lot of mistake, uh, a, a lot of issues. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, be extensive into the list of filters. That's an entire, you know, master thesis. You just see it. But the ones that I've been, well, I've been using the most, uh, low pass, low pass, high pass, and band pass filters. So you just check what are the frequencies of the artifacts that are most uh, or mostly appear in, in the signal that you are studying. Most of, this, of, the, of the artifacts are related to movement. So movement, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, is a beach. So you get uh, EMG, you get infected by movement. You get ECG infected by movement that you saw in the yeah, electrodermal activity. You yeah. saw yesterday when the Lara was moving. So you just get that one as well. For me, the worst is still the heart, the heart rate. When it comes to machine muscles. She, so she's studying movement. Movement. So for her, the signal, the signal is the movement. For us, the movement is the noise. So for her, the noise is whatever other uh, things that we are recording: heart rate, respiration. Yeah. Those things are like, you know, noise. So depending on the type of phenomenon that you are studying, some things can be seen as uh, noise and some other things can be seen as um, signal. So this is an example of how you can reduce movement artifacts from uh, uh, EMG, in this case, electro, uh, my, electromyography uh, signals, so signals from the electrical muscles, electrical activity in the muscles. So you see over here, it has also a little bit of wandering and uh, um, some noise related to the um, contractions. Most of these peaks are like when you have the electrodes and you make a contraction and then you get something like this, boom, it's a burst. So in order to do uh, what is called in EMG the, the, uh, the envelope, which is what you want basically, what is the signal that is going ahead through all those bur bursts, you need to filter the signal first. So without and, and with a bandpass filter. This is another uh, cool filter for uh, signal smoothing. So this is uh, IMU signal. I don't know if you know this, but uh, a lot of the uh, uh, IMU data that we were getting was a lot of like with a lot of peaks and things. So even tiny movements that Christina was recording. So maybe when you are wearing this, you don't want to see. Uh, you are not caring that much about uh, smooth movement that the person is doing. You're caring mostly about the gross movements that the person is executing when interacting with the system. You don't want to see like the person is doing this or maybe shaking the hand. So for smoothing those signals, so you can use uh, filters like the median. Uh, um, Kalman is an entire world of filters, but they, they also use it a lot. Uh, Savisky, another uh, Russian scientist, I think, also are working a lot with those signals or with those filters, and um, there's plenty of implementation there. So, there's a good example of you have the data without filtering, pretty similar to what we saw on the um, uh, signal of, uh, of Christina. So, you see, there's a lot of like peaks going on here. When you apply a specific filter, you can see the tone of the peaks. Uh, uh, you, you smooth some of those peaks, but at the same time you're losing some information. Uh, and this is an, uh, another filter in which you probably can see a better representation of the type of smooth movement you want to see. So, uh, filters to smooth. Um, with the time, you start getting um, intuition around the signals. So it's like everything. When you're spending too much time with something, you start seeing that, oh, this is, this is off. Like this is not a signal that is supposed to be, or this is not similar to what I've seen that is normal. And even those, you know, some of the hardware and software tools, they give you sample data. When you check that sample data versus the data that you have, you can start saying they're out of the ranges or just the behavior is weird. So developing that intuition is super important if you want to, you know, go deep into physiological signal processing. And each on each signal, you will start developing that intuition and you will be able to visually identify things. That's actually the ground truth. And there's people that want to test algorithms. But what they do is they sit down experts on each signal. So the expert will tell you, yes, it's better signal or this signal is correct or not. And then they will compare that against ground truth. So there's not another ground truth for that, but experience similar to what happens on all, a lot of the medical fields. 
So, for feature extraction, what do we want to do? What is the goal? Transforming the raw data that we are getting, all the signals that we have been collecting is mostly raw data. What we want to do that is to basically bring those into a finite, and I, I highlight the, 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 the word fi uh, finite because you can extract for each of the signals that we have seen here, like hundreds and hundreds of features. Are those features representative of what you are trying to study? Maybe yes. But selecting a, a, a group on a specific subset of those features is um, an art. And it's actually a, a very important aspect. So um, it's important that they can um, efficiently represent that physiological phenomenon, for instance. So if you want to study something like um, uh, engagement, arousal, stress, or anxiety in people, so there's already some uh, psychophysiological models for each of the signals that we are studying. That means what is what do we know a science, a scientific community, a scientific community. How do we what do we know about this specific signal for this specific psychological state? So there's again some models. This is uh, called the model of optimal arousal. What does it mean? So we have over here performance of a participant doing a task versus the arousal levels. But we saw yesterday arousal can be uh, measured through the electrodermal activity signals, but it can be also measured through heart rate variability or EEG. So when the performance of somebody is uh, relatively low, uh, sorry, is relatively weak, and we have uh, we will have uh, low levels of arousal. So when the person is somehow getting into a more intense or high performance, you will see that uh, we are switching from uh, you know something that is uh, increasing rapidly to a plateau kind of uh, signal. So this is the green part is what is called a state of optimal arousal. Uh, in gaming, they call it flow. Uh, in a lot of psychological studies, and they also call it engagement. So if the person is so well focused on the task and the person is performing well into that task, when you're playing a game and you're very good and the moving level from level, what are you gonna get? Like high levels of arousal, you're gonna be excited, emotionally excited about what is happening. But what happens when you push a lot of the game or the task to something that is super hard? So what is gonna happen is the arousal instead of keep increasing, it's gonna reach the plateau and it's going to decrease because you're going to start feeling frustrated, you're going to uh, start feeling stress, fatigue, or you're going to feel uh, some sort of anxiety because you cannot get uh, uh, to the performance uh, that you want or desire. So that's a model that is already built in the scientific community and they know about arousal. So um, if you want to study arousal, uh, using some of these physiological descriptors. So the best thing you can do is check the models, psychophysiological models of arousal, how do they react? Then the, design a task that you don't push people towards frustration unless you are studying frustration. <laughs> um, and check what are the best features that will represent arousal or what is called autonomic activation. So this is part of the, the table for uh, uh, table for one that I just shared with you that uh, put, just put the link there and they basically mentioned what is the index so index would be more like a psychological state what are the associated signals so you got EDA EEG or even a speech can be related to this and then what are the metrics so the, they even have if they are increasing or decreasing the so skin conductors uh, level is increasing when you, your arousal is high. The skin conductor responses are increasing. That means that if you are aroused, maybe you will get one, maybe you will keep getting more and more responses, or you will get a stepping uh, response as the ones that we saw yesterday. So and the same thing applies for any uh, of the other metrics. So it's very important for you to previously to wire people and previously to define what is the signal that you want to use in your experiment to make a, uh, uh, an investigation, uh, uh, a little bit of research on what are the models that already exist and what are the features or the best signals that could represent those physiological psychological states. Cool? Mm -hmm.
so uh, we will move now to see the features. So I'm gonna call uh, Trevor, which is gonna basically show us uh, what he has done. Sorry, sad. He has done some um, um, research on uh, structing features with uh, IME data. Then we will move to the EDA data, and if we have time, we will see the heart rate variability uh, data as well. So, uh, he will show us and uh, share the link of the scripts that we have and on how you can um, access them based on the repository. Sad? How are you doing? Okay, let me switch. Let me switch the audio to the TV, so you can also share the slides that you have. Um, Okay, so let me just remove this filter. Okay, so you can, oh, this is sad, so he was uh, with us, he's a uh, autograph research assistant, and he was working on preparing and helping us preparing the scripts, so you can just get your IMU data, uh, uh, see some pre-processing and pre-processing signals to clean, and then extract all the features that we saw in the, in the, into the table. So sad, you can just go ahead. I think they are hearing you well. Are you hearing us well? Yep, yep, I can hear you guys well. That's cool. Alright, that's cool. Mm. Yep, so uh, I have uh, my things in a Jupyter notebook because I think that's a very uh, convenient way to get plots in Python, especially, and uh, see all that data uh, in front at once, cell by cell. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, so, sorry, uh, Sad, you, Sad, you're also part of the group uh, that we have created for this workshop, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, do I send the links there? Yeah, would you please like send the links there so people will, will have them uh, uh, in the group? I mean, we'll put everything in the website, but for now, can you just put it there so people can uh, check Alright, it? Yeah. I also have a collab notebook, um, just in case like someone doesn't have the things like the setup, so should be um, there, so... Uh, uh, the GitHub link is this, if you want to just have a look at it. So, also the, the report is here. And yeah, any any other links should also be in the collab as well. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I believe the collab um, has links to even the files and other, other places if you want those. But yeah, uh, yeah, so. Uh, in this, I have a Jupyter Notebook, which basically goes over how to actually, you have your CSV file that you collected using the consensus or uh, other software. And then you have this CSV file and you want to basically extract information from it. So the first thing I'll, I'll show is just the, the easy and simple way of just, uh, of actually um, loading in this CSV file into actually a Python dictionary so that you can interact with it and uh, I guess actually have the data in like a place where you can manipulate it. And then I'll go over some of the functions uh, or API to extract these features. And once we have these features, the other things you can do with it, such as analyzing it um, and epoching data if you would like to do other certain things based on uh, application. So to start off with, um, just loading the data. So I have all my um, functions and API in this one Python file. I believe I put the GitHub link, so uh, I'll go over those when I go over the relevant functions. So uh, what this what this loading does is essentially you just need to give path to the CSV file, 
you need to explicitly state the sampling frequency that was used. It defaults to, I believe, 500. Uh, you, can, you can set it to change that based on what you want. But it is very important that the sampling frequency is correct. Yeah, sorry, Sam. Uh, when we are recording the data using the Shimmer device in the consensus software, you can define what is the sampling frequency. Depending on the sensor, oh. they have um, um, recommended sampling frequency. So IMUs are pretty high. So you are really collecting, like, uh, I think 250 or, or 400 samples per second. But for the EDA, like, your EDA is not going to vary that much. So you can get that to 100, 100 hertz and that will be more than enough. So, but those things are normally written when you're recording the data, you can define those, or even in the CSV is written, I don't remember, no, I don't think in the CSV is written. Uh, is in the CSV, we can actually look at the CSV right now, I don't think it is written anywhere in the CSV, I don't see, uh, yeah, but I, I, I don't believe it's written in the CSV, which is, yeah, it's probably important to, yeah. Uh, when, yeah. when, you, when, you, when you record the data, you will have like CSV file similar to that, that the one that Sad was showing. There's some sensors that actually in the headings, you can see, so in this headings, you can see what is the sampling frequency and the, the time that that thing what was uh, recording and all the variables, but Shimmer devices, they don't do that. So they just throw you the, the data and the columns. Sorry, Sad, thank you. Can continue. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go over a bit more about the CSVs uh, or this the CSV file specifically. So when we so reading it in, it's just one simple line, so you don't have to do all the the dot read CSV and do that do that cleaning. So this kind of takes care of that for you. You just need to specify what type of separation is used in the CSV file, because um, that's also something that uh, I believe sometimes can vary. So sometimes people use commas, you know. Sometimes it's tabs. Sometimes it's other things. So, uh, for example, in this in this file, they use tabs. Uh, if you can see to separate the data, it might also be commas. So just make sure that's uh, correct. And also, if you want to show details, so what what it does is when it reads the CSV file, there are headings, and these headings contain information about whether this is a timestamp or whether this is the accelerometer or whether this is a gyroscope. So it basically gives information and it finds whether the units were calibrated and it actually tells you the units itself. So over here, it, it shows that the time step is in milliseconds, that the accelerometer units is in meters, like in acceleration meters per second squared, and so on and so forth. So it gives this information. If it's not stated in the CSV file, it will just say no units. If you put plotting true, it will give you a quick plot. So over here we have a CSV file that we just quickly, you know, plot it in. And over here uh, these spikes are instances of someone doing a clap. So that, that's why you can see distinct uh, movements over here. So uh, I guess this helps for like a quick look at it. And if, if you obviously don't want it and you want, uh, you just want the data, you can obviously set it to false. Uh, but yeah. So um, so over here. Once you have this IMU data in the form of a dictionary, so uh, so what you can see is if you look at the keys, you can see what keys are in it. And let's say, so it's all in this dictionary object. It has the accelerometer uh, fields, it has the gyroscope, and let's say you only want the the accelerometer. And so what you could do is you could uh, you could just state, you, you could use it exactly like a dictionary and you could, you could state the field. So if you do it like this over here, you're just taking that field. You're just taking that, and you could even plot it individually if you wanted to analyze it uh, independently to the others. So over here, you see it's just plotting that bit. So we've extracted one of the, and you can do it for any field you want, any subset of fields, and you can really, it's a really convenient way of playing around with uh, the data. Also, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. If, any, if I'm being clear about one thing, if, I'm, if, if, if you think that I might be skipping some uh, important information, just uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt me. But yeah, so everything's in this dictionary object, and the keys are already printed for here. It's over here, so these are the keys if you want to use them. And uh, if, if, if for some reason there's, th those are not the keys, you could always just, you could always check the keys depending on what you uh, name them. 
So like this, you can always just the keys themselves. So I believe that covers the um, just the loading in the data part. Uh, it handles it up robustly. So now when we want to extract the features itself, there are uh, multiple ways which you can do that. So if we look at this signal, uh, the, the one way to do it is basically to have like a slide, a uh, sliding window. So it basically uh, slides for the signal, and for a specified period of time, uh, it essentially gets the features for that window. So if you have a period of say 10 seconds, in these in this in the first 10 seconds, uh, it will extract the features, and then it'll do that for every 10 second window, and it'll basically slide over the signal like that. So it's important again, uh, you can define the sample frequency, uh, you define the window size, over here it's uh, 6.7 seconds, and then you pass this uh, in the parameters. Over here, this is a function called get underscore stat underscore features. So what this uh, function does is it essentially for each field, it gets the defined feature, it gets the mean it gets the uh, uh, root mean squared, it gets the standard deviation, it gets the kurtosis, it gets the skewness, and the description of these features can be uh, found in the report, which I've also linked. So over here it tells what, the, uh, what each of these features are doing. And also again, it gets all of this in a dictionary format. So these will, would be these, and you can get these individually, you can see them all. Again, uh, you can have plotting step to do, so it does plot these features. So a quick look, you can see how how the mean of the signal varies with time. So over here you have the signal itself. You can see how the mean of a 10 second or a 6.7 second window varies with time. And you can see that for all these types of um, features. But if you don't want to see all of them, you can always just put plotting equals false and um, you could check them individually. So over here, we have the sliding under window underscore stats. Uh, we have this, we named this as a variable or the dictionary. So we could check the keys in it. So sliding underscore window underscore stats dot keys. And then you see what keys are in it. And based on that, you can select, let's say you want to plot the, the mean of the x axis of the accelerometer. These are all accelerometer features. So uh, if you wanted to see those, you could do mean underscore ln underscore x. And then you can plot that, have a quick look at exactly what that looks like. Uh, and yeah, you see how it varies with, I guess you could say, the clap. So, this is essentially a, a good summary of how the features work, how they're extracted. And uh, based on this, you can do all sorts of things. A lot of people, they use this data classifiers. Um, you can also do just um, sliding uh, underscore window underscore stats dot value. Oh, okay. just the sorry, value. sorry, sir. Uh, we didn't uh, talk a lot about windowing because again, that's a, a whole entire world. But in a sense, what you do is basically, based on the time series that you have, you define windows in which you want to take chunks of your signal and then you want to extract features on what happened there. How do you select the windows is based on what we were discussing yesterday or how quickly the signal might change based on the stimulus that you're providing. So you don't want, for instance, in EDA, you don't want to extract features every one or two seconds because the signal probably is not going to vary that much during those seconds. So you select some windows depending on if the signal is a, is a low pace or is a fast pace signal and also depending on the type of features uh, that you select. But in a sense you just move the, the window here and then you extract features and then you keep extracting features based on the window that is basically sliding uh, and, 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 and getting the features based on, on a specific window length. So. That's something that we do a lot in physiological, uh, when um, uh, processing physiological signals, 
and again it's important for you to define the size of the window normally the, when you check the type of signal that you want when you check the feature that you say okay this is the feature that seems to be more relevant to the word that i'm doing you find in the papers that they define the in the methods they define the signal processing or the, the, the data analysis that they have they always define the the, the metrics or the, the size of the window or the type of filter that they were using so you can also uh, try to use those we have here again a finite list of uh, features. Um, actually, uh, Sad made a, a, an interesting research on the different metrics that are the most popular. So the ones that Sad is showing are the most popular in IMUs for the type of research we are doing. Um, but again, there's a plenty of more features there uh, for each of the things that you want to study. Sorry, you can go ahead, Sad. Absolutely, yeah. And also to add on to like in terms of like selecting windows, as if you're just like doing some exploration, like once you like have a quick look at the like let's say the, this data, you can see that if you choose like a 0.5 second window, you probably won't get that much information because that's that's like a line over here. But if you say select a 10 second window, you might be able to capture a, a decent amount. Uh, maybe probably better to have around seven seconds, because at the same time if you do a window that's too long, say 20 seconds, you're like overlapping between um, uh, too many things. And I guess depending on what's being done, I guess uh, you probably need to select that, uh, as John mentioned, uh, uh, intelligently selecting that window size is very important to extract the features. But yeah, so this is essentially, if you want to just have a quick look in terms of how, how the mean is changing, you can see like dips in certain features. Yeah, you can see, basically see how these features are basically describing uh, what we see here in many different ways. And as things get subtler, uh, these become more significant, uh, essentially, for uh, analysis. And you briefly show, so, yeah. us, show us that. What was the activity that you were doing when recording these signals? Just so oh, yeah. Of course. No, just show so, us you, you, you doing the activity. Oh, right now? OK, so I, I was like, basically, I had, the, um, I had the accelerometer on my wrist. And I, I just, uh, at, at certain points, I just clap, just, uh, just to see the variation of the signal. And the reason I chose the movement of clapping is because it is um, classified a lot of the time as a, a stereo motor movement that can be seen at, you know, uh, or can be an indicator of uh, some type of disorders and other things like pigeoning. So I just wanted to choose like something clapping uh, or, or something like that. So yeah, just a, a wrist on the wrist. Just doing this, and this is what you see. So if, if I clap more more ex frequently, you see more frequent signals. If I just clap once, you probably see uh, this signal right here with just one one peak. So the number of peaks could uh, probably be quite important. All right. So th that basically for the sliding window as it slides, the sim this is uh, the type of features that you could expect to see. Now, uh, now when, we come, when it comes to epoching, you can only epoch if you know the onset of the activity you're trying to look for. So, so we, have, we haven't mentioned here about epoching, just def define that briefly. All right, all right. So um, over here, let's say we have this, 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 this signal, right? It's, it's a very large, I guess in this case it's not that large, it's like one minute, but when you're looking at sessions with like 40 minutes of data, and you only want specific windows or specific, I guess, boxes of data. So let's say over here, you don't want a sliding window to over the whole signal because let's say during the session, there were time periods where you didn't really do things that were that important. So what epoching does is if you give it an onset, so you say, all right, there was an activity at about 10.3 seconds. Because the mark that uh, we mentioned yesterday. Yeah, you know, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Normally there'd be like a marker. Uh, so over here, let's say at 10.3 seconds, you know that somebody clapped. So you, you would basically, from that 10.3 seconds instance, you could basically define a window relative to that to capture, uh, capture like a mini, a subset of the signal. So for example, like, let's say you had a, a, an event at 10.3 seconds, you'd be able to capture the five seconds after that. So from 10.3 seconds to 15.3 seconds. Uh, in some applications, you can even get like a uh, time before that. So you could get from 9.3 seconds to 4.3 and you define it 
all types of interesting ways. So basically, uh, what you need for epoching is you need these onset times. So you need to know that all right, this first clap at 10.3 seconds, he also clapped at 20.1 seconds or at the 30 second mark, at the 40 second mark, at the 50 second mark. So you need to, you need to have information. Uh, and if you do have this information, you also define for how long the window is. So you can say onset at 10.3 seconds, it, the epoch window length will be for, let's say, 4 seconds. We would get 10.3 to 14.3. Uh, and get that, and it get that for each onset that is defined. So over here, I did uh, quite a simple implementation in that you just need a list of the onset times. So let's say if if you push in with markers or however uh, the method you want to do to you sorry sorry so you normally get this once when you do the in the when you record the data you get this vector from the system for the consensus it gives you all the timestamp when the, the the activities were happening. Like for you know some of the experiments that we have, we probably we would like to mark when you are doing things with the wizard of when you are switching things, or sometimes even when you are seeing observations of people, like you are uh, seeing how people are reacting when they are interacting with a robot, and you see oh in this moment the person got excited, or you mark those things, and then you analyze if that uh, perceived excitement that you saw in your subject was actually reflecting some changes. Uh, measurable changes in physiological signals. You see that's again for more controlled uh, experiment uh, that can be uh, somehow helpful. Yeah, so um uh yeah so over here like all, all you need to do is you need to d define these in a list and uh, as John mentioned you can collect there are various ways to collect it using the, the systems and software. So as an input it takes these onset times as uh, as an input, it also takes the epoch size. So how how long do you want this epoch to be? Do you want it to be two seconds or three seconds or or 0.5 seconds? Uh, how how however many you wish. And of course, as usual, the, the sampling frequency is always important. It's always important to get that correct. So basically, this function it automatically once you have the onset times, it will automatically epoch this data. Now it's a very interesting thing to get the features from these epochs because you can, when you have these features, you can do a very clear cut comparison. So over here we have uh, we have this, and the, the function that's used uh, to get the statistics for epoch data is the same. You just need to change one setting. So there's an argument that says epochs. Uh, you have to set it to true. So if you look before, epochs was set to false for sliding window. Over here, when you have epoch data, you can set it. You can you you simply set it to true, and it basically gets it gets the statistics for the cohort of the epochs that you have. So you have uh, let's say these these uh, epochs for clapping. Uh, you get the you get the statistics for that specific, and the same thing for uh, the station one. But over here, the best way, uh, and the way that I've seen in literature and how they do these comparisons is that they use box plots, and uh, these these are very useful, and I'll, and I'll get into these uh, in, a, in a second. Uh, first, I, I'd just like to show um, uh, some plots. So over here, we've just defined the, the time series, just a list uh, for the time, like a, a, a vector for time, um, so if you want to customize your plots, and uh, just done a quick, uh, a couple more quick plots on accelerometer acceleration, which I, which I believe I showed, and how it, how it varies. So over here you see how the acceleration, and you look at the mean and how it varies, and you can basically do a, a side by side comparison and uh, uh, essentially make the types of insights that you'd be uh, that, that that you'd look for. And if and if you notice, it only starts. For sliding window, at least, it only starts the feature extraction once you've met the minimum length for the for the window size. Uh, so yeah, uh, and and yeah, over here we have different features. So now let's get to the plot of the epoch sessions themselves. So uh, the first thing you need to know uh, do in a Python uh, setting is you need to uh, get the list of the statistics that you'd like. 
So over here, this would just be the, the dictionary keys. The dictionary keys are the names of the statistics. Then you basically use matplotlib to plot, the, uh, plot them. So um, if you're familiar with uh, matplotlib, their, their subplots are, are very um, effective in that you just have to define the number of, uh, I believe, rows and the number of columns. It could be interchangeable. I, I, I don't know which one. I can't recall which one comes first, but anyway, this, uh, you define those, define the, the, fig, uh, the figure size. Basically, you do a box plot for each pair uh, of features. So let's say you have your clapping, you have the epoch clapping statistics, and you have the uh, epoch station statistics, where, uh, where someone's doing nothing, basically. So, and you want to compare between these two. You can essentially compare between the two for each and every single feature. So over here, we see the difference in the mean between uh, no clapping and clapping for the accelerometer x-axis. And you, you essentially can look at multiple of these features and you can see where there's a big difference. So over here, you see um, over here yeah, in the standard sorry, 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 just, is, uh, yeah, just to, to, to wrap up, uh, to move to the next um, uh, topic, what it's basically showing, like, how do you move from having your data recorded from the specific conditions to cleaning and extracting the features and comparing those based on the, the data that you have. So you have a control condition versus the experimental condition. You can see how some of the kinematic features were varying based on the box plots. Then you will need to do the statistics to see if they are uh, statistically significantly different or not. But in a sense that, you, you know, this is kind of like the path line of loading the data, extracting the features, and comparing the features if you have different files. Or even if you are recording the entire session, then you will need to segment or to cut up and say, okay, that was the first condition, that was the second condition, third condition, and then you separate those uh, using some of the um, methods that he was describing here, and then plotting them initially at least to see if there is a difference in some of the uh, metrics that we were exposing here. And then you will need to move to the statistical analysis. Uh, so, sorry, sad to interrupt you. I'm mean, just um, uh, rushing a, a little bit of the, the things. I don't know if you want to um, say something else beyond the, the, the comparison with the box plots. Uh, no, uh, this, is, this is just about wraps it up because yeah, this is the, the main thing in, in terms of like the data exploration, just being able to visualize these features. And based on this, I guess uh, it's basically a way of. Uh, taking the step in terms of choosing which features you might think are interesting or relevant to a certain, uh, I guess, uh, field, and uh, and yeah, this is basically uh, what's what's done, and uh, I guess yeah, uh, I guess that, that that just about sums it up, and uh, I guess the 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 collab notebook is there on GitHub for more. I guess you could have a look at the actual code in. Because I know I skipped over a, a lot of it um, due to the interest of time, so uh, those those can be analyzed more. And uh, I I have commented rather extensively, so it should be uh, quite readable. Very easy. Mm -hmm. so. And yep, and uh, yeah, the, this is there for more specific details about um, the windows window side, the data point, and so it's it's all linked, all all, uh, all files. Uh, or links to the files are linked in the, in the notebooks, and uh, the report is also linked at uh, cool. things there's on GitHub, it's on Colab, it's in um, the basis, so. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Sounds good, so th uh, thank you for preparing all the, the material. Uh, if you have like any specific questions on any news, like he probably will be the guy to check. There's also some of the MATLAB tools to analyze this, but if you want to go very exploratory, uh, exp exploratory, we'll recommend you to get a sensor get data, just mimic some of the conditions of experimental design that you're doing, run some of these things and start checking, you know, what are the descriptors of, or the different features describing about the, the uh, scenario that you will have. That will be my recommendation. There's not more time for that. Uh, thank you, Seth, for your participation and uh, I'm gonna continue here, okay? Okay, yep, yep, sounds good. All right, uh, take care. Thank, thank you, Seth. So, I use feature instruction. <laughs> I know it's a lot of information, like cutting the epochs, the window in, all that stuff. Like, 
hope that the information that he has prepared can be maybe useful to simplify some of the steps that you will have to do. But with all the signals that you have, most of the times you need to do the same. So and that's why uh, we will move now to, I'm gonna leave this for the end. So we can jump to, uh, because I think Isha is gonna be around. So I would like to jump to uh, electrodermal activity. Uh, any questions before? So earlier you said it's uh, usually the heart rate and is noise for the physiological data and the physiological data is, or the movement data is noise for the heart rate. Most of the times movement is noise for a lot of the physiological signals that we have seen. EEG, electroencephalography, EMG, uh, ECG, mm -hmm. the movement is considered an so, artifact. So can you capture both simultaneously or should you have an experiment that does one or the other so that you can only... Indeed, they use um, movement uh, or they record movement in order to remove movement artifacts. So in EEG, they, they use that a lot. So they use the EEG and the EEG they put at IMU. So you know exactly when people are doing this. So you compare the EEG data and they apply specific filters for uh, removing artifacts to the moment that the person was agitated or moving or having an acceleration of the head moment. Mm -hmm. so that's actually a, a, an interesting in the, methodology. In the EEG as well, when you're uh, measuring muscle activation, there is an electrode that is uh, for the heart rate activity. So you're not, I mean, you, you're going to use it to, to subtract it mm -hmm. from the whole signal. Because you're, you're not aiming on capturing her rate, but you need it because you're going to see the, the peaks, right? It's like noise. Right. So you want to delete it. So you capture both signals, mm -hmm. and one, you know that it's going to be deleted. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, why do you have like this, this article when you move users? Is it because of the sensor is not so perfect? Is it because you have to plug the sensor inside the, the, the person's you know, tissue to, have to remove those? Those artifacts, or is it because the movement creates electro? It's a little bit of everything. First, the position of the electrodes, like they're superficial, so they go, uh, you know, to the, directly to the skin. So when you move, there's like, um, um, you know, disturbance of what, uh, what uh, is being recorded. So these are electrophysiological mm -hmm. metrics. So the movement normally affect uh, electricity that is being produced there plus the the you know the movement itself of the electrodes so it's coming need, from many different sources that's why you need to like in order to prevent most of the stuff you need to make sure to clean it properly to shave it just to at least to take the skin pants that that's a lot of uh, movement artifacts that comes from the skin so yeah, for some specific experiments, it's even, as I mentioned before, the EEG, the, the brain-computer interface experiments, like they prefer shape. Yeah, the people yeah. are like, uh, without a lot of hair, because the hair can also bring a motion or movement artifacts. So in our case, the best thing we can do is to clean the surface to get, we have some electrodes here that they are, they attach pretty well. So there's some, some electrodes that they move fairly quickly and that will ruin your signal. The problem with those electrodes is they really get stick into your skin. So at the moment that you remove them, they're coming with the hit with the hair and everything. <laughs> so when you put it in the chest for instance, like it, it does this male participant that you will get them uh, a little bit of pain. And you need to describe that pain in your ethics. <laughs> so they don't like uh, the you know you skip those things. And they since they have been seeing um, the applications of people with this type of electrodes, they know. So they know pretty well if you're using which sensor, so are you using, oh, or you, what was the type of electrodes that you're using and those type of things, if you get the sneaky reviewers. <laughs> so they will let you know. Uh, so we saw um, data collection of EDA, CGA, news. We saw more or less the path line of feature extraction, and we saw the, the feature extraction of IMUs. Now we move to the feature extraction of EDA signals. Um, I like this signal because it's, real, it's, it's fairly simple. It gets two branches. First, it's called the tonic. Tonic, as we saw yesterday, was basically when we were recording the Lara, and you saw like she was 
like that. No, the, you know, the, 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 it's kind of like the, the, um, I put it over here. It's kind of like the base, it's not like the baseline, it's more like the, the level of your conductance without any type of stimulus. So without any type of response. That's your, uh, what is called the skin conductance level. So flow changes, that's a tonic. And then we have a second branch of a second category of features that are coming from the, uh, the FASIC. So these are the rapid changes. So when I scream to you, then we go to uh, what is called a skin conductance response. And then uh, that skin conductance response uh, has a specific set of features that you can extract. So uh, there are two types. Some of them can be related to events. So stimulus and uh, response. Some of them just happen. So that's why it's important to know exactly when the stimulus was happening so you can associate that response to that stimulus. Because sometimes you are seated, you are calm, and then boom, you have a pick. Why? Because you were thinking of something that, I don't know, was disgusting for you, or you just got a coffee that morning, and you know, that can uh, create a specific responses on you, or like many other different factors. Those are called non-specific skin conducting responses. So <clears throat> this tonic is pretty good in um, defining what is called changes in the autonomic arousal. So for instance, you want to compare three different conditions, uh, the, the reaction of a person to three different roles. So you record the three different conditions, you clean, you extract only the tonic stage, and you can uh, say which robot was somehow producing more uh, act activation or more arousal in, in a person based on purely the skin conductance level. So when you strike it, you will see that, you know, when people are in the baseline, they're normally here. When there's something happened, they can have the peaks, the peaks, but you know, the level will be increasing. Remove the peaks, the level will be increasing or decreasing, increasing or decreasing. So you will be able to say which condition was kind of like producing more, um, I don't want to say excitement, so the correct one is sympathetic activation. But th that sympathetic activation, again, is related to the fight and flight responses, which are related to arousal levels, which are related to excitement, frustration, or uh, even um, anxiety or stress. So that's your sympathetic nervous system reflecting. The, 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 the facing ones are basically rapid fluctuations. So the peaks that you see, and uh, those are like, uh, can be or not associated to the stimulus that we were describing. Is in a nutshell, or visually speaking, is this. So you see, this is the skin conductance level, and these are the peaks that you're having, depending on the stimulus that you're providing, or sometimes depending on the EDA profile that the person might have. So, when you get your uh, galvanic skin response signal, or you, when you get your electrodermal activity signal from these sensors, you will get something like this. The, pro the problem will be, okay, how can we separate both? But you want to separate both because they are both telling you different things about what was happening. Whereas the tonic thing is telling you overall, what was the person during that experience, five, 10 minutes, the the, 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 the face of one is telling you how people were responding to the stimulus that you were provoking. This is, this is one of the patterns that you show us, that it goes with the time it, and you stimulate it, it goes a bit up yeah. and up and up. And step, uh, step, uh, yes. the step, the stepping one. Yeah. So that is in the tonic. So the tonic gives you that pattern, right? So you have to, for, to check the patterns, you should take a look at the tonic. Um, no, actually the patterns is the, 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 the whole thing, okay. but, it's, but if you check only the tonic, like still you will see yeah. there's people like responding to that. The, what is important to consider in the phasic is actually the, the features of the peak itself. So you see the onset, the amplitude. Why? Because, you know, the, the, for instance, the, uh, the bigger the amplitude, so you will say the bigger aroused people can be. So that's kind of like directly uh, associated to those things. And that's why, you know, in order to compare uh, against, or in order to compare people with the EDA, so you need to normalize the signal, mm -hmm. which I will show you how to, how to do. But in a sense, that's what you want to do, yeah? 
So is the noise coming from movement also included in phasing? Or? The, the movement actually enters in both. Oh. So tonic and, tap, uh, and, 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 and phasing. For instance, when you start moving a lot, studying EDA in exercise is signal processing help. <laughs> because remember, these are sweat glands. Sweat glands are um, um, uh, um, varying their conductance based on sweating. When you're doing exercise, you are sweating. That means that you, at some point you wouldn't be able to recognize if the peaks were related to an arousal stimulus or just because people are exercising. Because it's sweat glands, so you're recording the same thing. So that's why there's not a lot of studies of EVA on exercise. I did one for my PhD and that was a that was hard for me to digest everything. So I needed to record all the stimulus and kind of like do some normalization of the signal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, movement affects both. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, when we should record this tonic? Just before the movement? Or after? Like when we are exposing them to the stimulus? Like five minutes before? Record, record, record what? Record what? Before exposing participants to the stimulus? Ah, oh, the baseline. Yeah, the baseline. Yeah. Or, or just... It's uh, can we get the pattern with the main stimulus recording of tonic? Yeah, again, so when you're doing the experiments, you don't necessarily need to have a, an EDA profile of people, but you know, those are just there. I haven't seen research like doing the profiling before. But when you, when you want to do the baseline, you want to do that before you are exposing people to the stimuli and as close as possible to the control variable that you want. As I mentioned before, you want to see what is the reaction of a specific behavior of a robot uh, producing in, in people. So for the baseline, you don't want to just put the person in a, on a chamber totally white and then yeah, allow people watching. there. You want to yeah. have the presence of the robot. So you know uh, the person without the presence of the robot might have a skin conductance that will heal. Mm -hmm. When you have the robot, then eventually people will have a skin conductance that will heal. And then when you have the robot doing something that you want to study, then you will have the skin conductance that will heal. So instead of recording this difference, you will be trying to mission these uh, differences, which is more accurate from a, a psychophysiological point of view. So, so in a perfect world, if you want to, to get rid of this novelty effect and all this bullshit, how, how much time of baseline you take, like a day or two days, a person to get used to the new environment, to get used to, to the robot movements and everything? How much uh, in a perfect, mm -hmm. perfect scenario? Yeah, uh, I will recommend for like reducing novelty, just, yeah, expose people first to the robot, um, you know, maybe some minutes before mm -hmm. the interaction somehow. So the, you know, the novelty effect is not necessarily there. Uh, uh, in experimental, no, not ideal, but what happens pragmatically, three minutes is very short, my, my own um, preference, five minutes seems to be more or less good because you don't want to take a lot of time of you know participants you also have conditions questionnaires mm -hmm. and things like that so you want to spend like that so i will say for the type of experiments we do five minutes five to ten minutes is a good baseline uh, and the robot should actually it would be better if robot can could speak and you know uh, interact because then you want to remove those things yeah sometimes when a robot starts speaking then yeah you can get really speak like that yeah. That kind of and, uh, yeah, you see, I think you want to remove, you, if you want to remove those things, you really want people with some level of ex exposition to the robots. But that's the same not only for physiological signals. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the same for the, any other signal that you want to record. You want to get people, you got to get rid of the novelty effect, which is something that most of the times doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. So how do you do, or what do you do to extract those uh, tonic and, and, and phasic, and then what is the type of uh, pre-processing that you do? So um, I found this one. I think it's very useful. So remember, that I mentioned there's an intersubject and intrasubject variability. So to be able to compare these people, uh, I mean, when you put two different signals, some of them might have the skin conductance level over here and some over here. And you got some peaks here, some peaks here. How do you compare with both? So you do a normalization. So how do you normalize? Is basically 
you get the each uh, moment of the signal and then you just check on the on the 10 meters thing what is the minimum value what is the maximum value so you get um, uh, 0 to 100 uh, 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 values this is not uh, uh, you know this is mostly used if you want to compare against people but if you have the same person in different uh, sessions uh, probably that's not, not that useful so it just allows you to facilitate that uh, comparison you normally try to do that when uh, you want to see what is the arousal effect or one specific condition across 15 or 20 people so you do the normalization first now this is the problem like this is the type of signal that you're going to get when you are uh, using electrodermal activity uh, these are like three minutes so this the blue one is the one that you're getting what you want to do is basically get a skin conductance level which is, would be the red one and you also want to know the peaks so you don't want to lose the peak because of, those are the specific responses to uh, uh, the stimulus so there is a, a, a mathematical transformation to do that and it's basically a convolution so what you do is um, uh, you use the deconvolution techniques to separate tonic and facet and, 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 fast, and uh, facet, uh, um, branches of that. So at the end you will be able to know uh, what are the peaks, what is exactly the, the, um, the amplitude of the peak, and at the same time you will be able to know how the skin conductance level varies across the sessions. Those are already implemented, so you don't have to use it. Uh, the deconvolution techniques are already there. And um, that's mostly to get the skin conductance levels. To be honest, the features that you can get from the uh, tonic part is mostly the level, the skin conductance level. So what is this? Uh, how we did it vary? So the standard deviation of the skin conductance level, maybe the Rudman square of the skin conductance level. But you know, there's not a lot because it's, not, it's a slow pace signal. But there's a lot of things that you can say about the peaks. So you can get things like, okay, you get the stimulus onset. So that moment that you present the stimulus, then you want to see how much, uh, how much time the person uh, spend before the actual reaction. So that's like the latency, so two seconds, three seconds. Those variables are, for instance, very interesting for seizures, as people starting seizures with e EDA. So they have epi epileptic, epileptic, epileptic um, seizures, 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 seizures. 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 So epileptic seizures. So they are using R buttons. So they uh, uh, were studying a lot of the EDA, and they can uh, predict when a person will have uh, an epileptic seizure by checking their skin conductance level in time and frequency. So you see, all of these the small things that are here can are somehow related to the things that re uh, response time in other adults. The same thing. When, when are people responding to the stimulus? That's also important. So you want to see the amplitude and what is called the recovery time. So once you get to the maximum. So all people are uh, recovering to uh, the baseline or basically the offset. So all of those are basically features of this. So good and bad signals. So again, when you start playing with the signals, you will start identif identifying the, um, you know, the signal is interesting or not, not interesting, well, well captured or not. So this signal, for instance, uh, if you see here, they have the same length. Uh, this is the um, EDA signal. What have you not? What do you notice here? For instance, um, you see this is like it's hard to see normally that a person is going to have a skin conductor's response that is like this. So you normally get a little bit smooth. So this is weird. You see these small thingies here as well. So those are like mostly artifacts. So I wouldn't trust the features structure from this one. So it probably this will be a data that it will discard because it doesn't really seem like an, uh, an EDA. Um, so an EDA behavior is more or less like this. So smooth transitions, you still have um, uh, peaks but they're recovering uh, somehow good. Uh, well, so um, you see visually, 
instead of going and processing the signal and extracting the features from this, you, you know, sometimes you really need to discard. And most of the studies that I've seen with more than 12, 15 people, you normally uh, need to consider that you will discard uh, from uh, 5 to 15% of your data. Why? Because the electrodes. Because there was a fail on the, you know, the, the, the person was just moving a lot and you didn't record. Markers, you didn't manage to do the markers correctly. So the Bluetooth connection, <laughs> boom, at some point just stopped recording and you didn't. Oh, and so consider that uh, statistical power when, when doing that. So if you are aiming for collecting 12, uh, so you need to probably collect three more because you know that at some point you will uh, remove this data. So left side could be because of the movements? Huh? Left side, the peaks could be because of the movements? Could be um, the electrodes, uh, sometimes when you don't place them correctly. Oh, okay. so those things. So there's some people that use products on the skins, like creams and those things that creates a barrier, a barrier before, uh, between the electrode and skin. So, you know, you will have these signals because of like many things. Sometimes with the optical sensors, even the skin color. Yeah. There was a, a, a long, long time ago that the Nintendo Wii, they were trying to create a, 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 a controller sensor with electrical, uh, with uh, photoplasmography. So the Wii mode, you actually co connected a, a thing for, me uh, for recording the blood volume pressure. And then you will get that you will get that signal into the Wii game sport. So you will be able to record the heart rate in real time and the game will react to it. So they launched they kind of like stop announced it, but the, the all the tests that they did, 90% of people, only 90% of people, the sensor was working. And a lot of the people that reported in the initial play test that was wasn't working was because the skin color. Mm -hmm. So the sensor was somehow sensitive. So the skin color was not recording correctly the heart rate, so it was not working for a certain percentage of the people that they test, so they couldn't release the sensor. So they abandoned the sensor. It was called the Vitality uh, Wii sensor. There was an attachment for the Wii mode. So you say, use your visual intuition. How many years you can be working in the city? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it takes some time to develop a visual intuition, but uh, yeah, after more more than the years is the frequency. Like how many signals are you processing? How many experiments are you doing per year? How many participants are you involving in those experiments? And how deep are you uh, na navigating it through the data analysis? You will develop some visual intuition. But uh, again, if you are planning to do some experiments, if you record some data and you just want um, some eyes to take a look if the signals they look good or not. Let me know, send me the screenshots and I will at least let you know like, yeah, I think maybe the signals they look good or not. But that's a very important thing to develop if you keep going in um, this field. EDA features, as I mentioned before, like we don't have, we are, we are not research, it's not being very creative with skin conductance levels. So it's what is the level and what is the deviation. But then you will get also a lot of the skin conductance uh, responses. We have some uh, Python libraries already imported from here and there. Isha was doing uh, uh, research on that. And I will ask her to briefly show you guys the uh, feature structure things for the EDA, for the ones that are interest, interested on, on using this. I will try to ask her to be as uh, um, quick as possible showing the algorithms and uh, she will share also the, the, the repository and the other things so you will be able to maybe use them. If she replies. She doesn't reply, but who is it? Hey, hello, Isha. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Cool, cool, cool. Um, uh, Sat just show us the IMU data processing. So mm -hmm. we were just going through the feature structure of the EDA. And as I mentioned before, it would be good if you can just point us to uh, point point us out to the, the the scripts that you were researching and developing for this, and kind of like a briefly uh, description of the path line of you know processing the EDA signal. We have around uh, mm -hmm. 
yeah, 15 to 20 minutes before uh, wrapping up the session. So <coughs> yeah, they are already hearing you. So you can go ahead. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen. Go ahead. Can everyone see the Jupyter notebook? Okay. Now. Yes, now we can. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so I'll just, this is just a notebook to go over the EDA feature extraction. Um, we'll go over how to load the data from the CSV file after we record it from the shimmer sensors. Um, how to pre-process the raw data, the decomposition of the data into the tonic and the phasic components, extracting features from the process data, as well as plotting the features. So we start with just importing the packages that we need. Um, two of the main packages that we're going to use are PyEDA and NeuroKit. And then firstly, we'll record the data into a data frame. So it's just a very simple function that takes in the URL of the CSV file and the column names that you want to extract. So that's just going to be the timestamps and the column that contains the EDA signals. And it's going to return a data frame that will have um, the signals, the timestamps, as well as um, just a calculation of the seconds that are elapsed to basically make it easier to plot the data. So this is just a plot of the raw data. You have time and seconds and the EDA signals. And then we can start the pre-processing. Which data was, what was the context of this data? Do you remind me, that was when you, when you were playing the games? Right, so this is when, this is about 19, 20 minutes of data that I recorded from the Shimmer sensors while I was playing the VR game. She was seated, playing some games, the sensors were attached, the controllers were also, she was also using the controller in the hand, so there's normally some friction between the controller and the sensor, uh, which, you know, had some noises somewhere there. But those how, are, many, how many sensors she used? Only one? One, yeah, one, two electrons. Just one sensor. Yeah. Go. yeah, you can continue, sorry. Okay, uh, so then we move on to the pre-processing. It's important to indicate some values here, like the sampling rate, um, the desired new sampling rates, because we're going to downsample the signals, and the cutoff frequency if we're going to filter the signals. So the package here uses a low-pass filter, and we just pass it a frequency, and then it'll do the filtering for us. I've plotted the filter data, as you can see, just for comparison, that was the raw data, and then this is the filtered one. Um, after doing that, we downsample the data, and then to better process it, we're going to segment the data. So you, you just have to provide the segment width, and again, the sampling rate, your new sampling rate, and then it's going to segment the data for you. Sorry, Isha, we didn't mention a lot about uh, upset, um down sampling and up sampling, but in a sense is when you have data that you have been collected on a, um, a sampling frequency that is probably not good to represent the type of signal that you have, but sometimes you want still to record, you always want to record like the sampling frequency that is um, uh, higher than uh, the kind of like the ideal frequency. Um, that, that you want to record. So sometimes for the slow pace signals, you need to down sample that. So these signals were, were recorded to 2 and 55 sampling frequency hertz, and then she, I think, lowered it down to 40. Uh, why do you do this? Is because you don't need that amount of samples, and then you can make the, uh, the, the, the behavior of the data a little bit smoother as well and easier to process. So it will take less time for the filters to, to be applied. So sorry, Isha. No, um, yeah, I forgot to mention that. And also because the sensors that we use, the shimmer sensor for 
the EDA data. It also has many other channels for different kinds of signals. So there's like IMU data that we're getting, acceleration, things like that. And that's why it's recorded at a, usually at a very high sampling rate than we need for EDA, which is also why we need to, why we need to downsample it. And then after that, we're going to basically perform a rolling mean function to smooth the data over like a moving average. And this is mainly to reduce any artifacts that are caused due to motion. So for example, while I was playing the game, there was like John mentioned previously, there was a lot of friction between um, my hand and the controller and there's gonna be artifacts that are caused due to that movement. So to reduce that, we're going to do a rolling mean function over the whole signal. And then we're going to segment the signal. So this is after we're done processing it, which includes the filtering, the downsampling, as well as smoothing the data. The next step is to decompose the EPA into tonic and basic components. So I can give you some context about this, uh, just using the slide. Um, can you please confirm that you can see the slide? Um, yes. Um, we, we just talked about this, so you can skip actually the slide and go directly to the implementation. Okay, okay. okay. So this is done using a very simple function. You just pass on the pre-processed data to this function of mirror kit and you mention your original sampling rate. And this is just a graph of, you can see the raw data in green, you can see the tonic in blue and the basic in orange. So it just creates a data frame with three different series of raw, tonic, and basic. And then we can start extracting features once we've done all of this. So here's just a list of some features that you can extract, uh, just individual functions to give you an idea of what's going on in the background. But I'll explain a more convenient function later that goes over the whole pipeline, including pre-processing as well as feature extraction. So you don't have to individually call um, the features. But so one of the features that we can extract is the onset and the offset of the peaks, because that is basically one of the most important things of EDA data, because we're trying to set peaks there. So getting information about the onset and offset is very important you get um, a 2D array that will have all the offsets and the offsets of the peaks. You can then pass that on to get the maximum value of the peak, to get the number of peaks in a particular segment, um, to get the mean value of the signal overall. So these features, it's not very um, useful to perform this feature extraction over the whole session because there's not much information that you can get out of just say the mean value of the data for the whole session. So we're going to perform that over segments instead, which will make more sense. Um, this is basically the convenient function that I was talking about earlier. You can call this function, it's called process statistical. You pass it your data and it will do the pre-processing, everything that I showed you earlier, and it will return uh, two dictionaries. So the dictionaries will will contain the segment indices, they will contain the number of peaks, the mean value of each segment, the max value peak in each segment, as well as a data frame of like the phasic, tonic, peak list, and index list. And you'll also get um, basically a nested list, which is a clean, that will contain the processor signal in case you want to use it for something else. Like So I can show you the plot of the statistical features for this entity data. Uh, basically the mean of the signal, the number of peaks, the maximum value of the peaks, and the amplitude of the peaks. There are also other functions to plot different kinds of plots. For example, the number of peaks, maybe it's more intuitive to understand using Instagram or something like that. There are options for that as well. A lot of sorry, a lot of the times, and similar to what Sal was showing, when you plot these features, they don't give you like a direct insight. <laughs> so you just see the behavior of the of the feature across time. But uh, when you have a very specific hypothesis, or like this feature, 
is related to the levels of anxiety or the levels of stress of a person, then you will you want to confirm that actually the person was exhibiting a behavior similar to the one you were expecting. So, for instance, when you uh, you know bring the robot or bring the behavior of the robot, you want to see that that signal is constantly increasing or decreasing based on what you are expecting from those stimulus. So that's that's why it's kind of like good to visualize some of the features. So in the pre kind of like sessions you do before going to the experiment, you you can just double check if the features are somehow exhibiting uh, this behavior before uh, putting or you need to modulate some things with the uh, with the robot or you know with whatever experiment you are doing in order to enhance those type of physiological responses. So it's always tricky, but if you can involve some pre-testing with two or three people outside there, you will be able to maybe identify things or identify um, features that are more or less relevant for your research. Um, another very interesting plot that we can do is this one that basically signifies with three different colors, the onset, the peak, and the half recovery time. So these three features are pretty important. Um, the recovery time is basically the 50% recovery time, which is when the signal reaches 50% of the maximum value of the previous peak. And I just depicted the plot of a, of a short portion of the data that I recorded because the whole 20 minute session is quite messy. But you can see, for example, the red is like, when the peak is starting, the blue is when it hits the maximum point of the peak, and the yellow is when it's like 50% recovery. Um, before I get to this, another um, important thing that we can do is performing event-related analysis on epochs. So you, you can call some functions to create epochs, especially if you have a study that's very event-related, so you're providing certain stimuli, and you want to see how it affects the person's EDA goals. You can pass in your data, you can pass in, there's information about how to create those events and there's functions that will help you find those events. And you can label the events. For example, this is just a sample data. This is not the one that I recorded earlier because mine wasn't really an event-related analysis. I, it was just like a long recording of me playing a game. But in this one, they have basically listed their events as something that would elicit a negative response in the user or a neutral response. And they find those events, and then for that, it returns a data frame that will identify whether there's a peak um, that is observed when there's a negative stimulus, for example. And it'll just be denoted by a one or a zero. So for example, here there was a negative event, and there was a peak observed in phasic components, so it's denoted with a one. But for the neutral, there wasn't a peak observed, so it's just zero. And it'll give you information about the peak amplitude, the event onset, um, and the recovery time. Yes, uh, sorry, this type of analysis is very good when you have all the information with the markers. <coughs> I did one study, for instance, when I have all the information about the game and the positive and negative uh, rewards that people were getting, for instance, when they were doing, like, scoring a point, so we were reinforcing them with something, similar to what we do with robots. So the robot was exhibiting a behavior of positive feedback. Yeah, keep, keep doing it. So what you can do with this type of analysis is indeed counting the amount of times that people were reacting to that stimulus you have. 10, 10 times that the robot was providing positive feedback. And then you see if there are, like, eight responses or seven responses, so once you uh, compute all of those responses, then you see what is the percentage of, of times that people were aroused or sympathetically activated by the positive feedback. So you can compare um, among conditions to see which one is kind of like producing more arousal of people based on the detection of those peaks. That's right. Um, another feature that we have in one of the packages here is an automatic feature extraction. Um, so this is basically just instead of extracting the statistical features that I mentioned earlier, this is a program that will generate automatic features that might help you get more information about the data. So you have an auto encoder and you pass on the data and then it trains um, the auto encoder using this prepare automatic function. 
And then after the autoencoder is trained, you call another function, which is basically process automatic, and you pass on your data. One thing to note here is that the size of the signals that you pass to the function have to be the same as the one that you trained your data with. So if you change the sampling size or if you make any alterations, then you have to train the autoencoder similar. And it'll basically pass a list of the features that it calculates. Um, I spoke about this a bit in the presentation, but basically there was a paper that did a lot of uh, exploration with this automatic extraction. And in their uh, findings, they found that they trained uh, uh, their models with statistical features as well as automatic features. And the, the application is basically to identify whether someone is stressed or not, so just a binary classification. And they found out that it, the, the automatically trained model performed much better than the one that was trained by statistical features. So this is also something that you could give a try. Cool, sounds good. Isha, can you please share the, the Jupyter Notebook and all the, the information in the uh, group that we have on uh, and Microsoft Teams, please? Yeah, um, is it okay if I do it a little bit later? Because I'm having some trouble loading one of the files. It's like pretty big. It's fine. And it's not. It's fine, no worries. Getting up. Yeah, yeah, no worries. As far as you can, uh, you can uh, do it, uh, you know, by the end of today, that will be nice. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Isha, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, questions related to EDA. I think, you know, it was a rush of, of a lot of things. But uh, yeah, thank you, Isha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, feature structure. Uh, she was mentioning about automatic feature structure. I don't know if you have noticed how uh, challenging it can be, even for an experienced person <laughs> dealing with physiological sensors, to extract those and to really see things visually. Uh, that's why I'm not like super excited about automatic feature structure, but uh, there's some problems there, so and, and, and it's, it's interesting to follow. Um, yeah, those are the things. I mean, I am also when I was in the I was mentioning some MATLAB tools. Um, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I um, created a, a toolbox that you know if you just want to take a closer look and you are more like comfortable with MATLAB so you can um, uh, download the, the, the tool and uh, I have it, I can show you how to use it but it's basically a physiological computing toolbox it has a guide user interface so it allows you to kind of like do some of the things that we're doing here in Python so you can, you know, uh, open the files this is an ECG data for instance this was some people doing exercise you see the baseline wandering happening there so you can uh, select if it is ECG, you can extract the peaks. Once you extract the peaks, you can also uh, do some uh, filtering of those peaks by like defining what is the amplitude and the height of those peaks. Then you will get the, this is the hard availability. We didn't go to the feature extraction of ECG today. We will see if we can call it tomorrow. But in a sense, what you do is basically you get the, 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 the hard rate variability and then you get the peaks and then you remove those peaks because those are clear artifacts. And then you can extract features depending on the signal. So you can extract the time domain and the frequency domain. And at the end, it's going to give you all the different values based on that. And you can copy and paste those values for conducting your statistical analysis. So I did this for electromyography, electrocardiography, and electrodermal activities, and electrodermal activity signals. So the tonic, um, basic, and uh, some other uh, things. So if you are more comfortable with MATLAB, they still exist. I will put the link for you to download it. Uh, it doesn't run very well in the latest version of MATLAB, so you will need to download probably, they say over here, the 2013 mm -hmm. version. 2013. Yeah. <laughs> version, but uh, it's because of the UI elements. So some of these buttons and things like that, they, after some, some moment, they just uh, didn't use that. And that's it for today.